Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Brooks Keel, the president of Gush University, and what a privilege and a pleasure it is to be with you here this afternoon to share a little bit uh, some of my thoughts on the state of the university, uh, uh, a bit of an overview of where we have been uh, past year, and a, a lot of discussion about what our future is going to look like. I've got some slides I want to show you, so I appreciate you bringing those up, uh, and we'll get started. It's a beautiful day here in Augusta. I hope it's a beautiful day wherever you are. Of course, it's a beautiful day anytime you're on the Gush University campus, and we're just uh, really, I'm just delighted to be able to have the opportunity to spend a little time with you. I don't think it goes, it shouldn't go without saying, 2020 was certainly a year like no other. Uh, for all kind of reasons that you all know very, very well. It certainly has been a year for our university. It's been, a, it's been a challenging year, no doubt, but it's also been an exciting year because of what I think it does in terms of setting up what our future is going to look like. And I, it, speaking of the future, and to kind of put things at least perspective, uh, into perspective for me, I got asked to serve on, on a panel with some of my distinguished colleagues throughout the state of Georgia on the future of higher education. Uh, and it just so happened that that panel discussion was part of a Zoom meeting. And I think that really brought home to me uh, what is the future of higher education when you have to do these sorts of things on Zoom. Uh, there's no doubt that COVID-19 has changed the way in which we do business. And, and I think there's a lot of great things we have learned from COVID-19 uh, that we will we'll be putting into place. But we want to get back to normal. Now, I want to get back to normal as much as you do. Uh, and I think because of that, the future of higher education in general and the future of higher education here at Augusta University looks incredibly bright. We've heard an awful lot about the new normal. Uh, I'd sometimes refer to it as the now normal uh, because we've had to be so flexible and so nimble in terms of changing on a dime. Uh, just when, right when we think things, okay, are, are settling down, well, I know what the new normal is going to look like. It changes, and I think if nothing else, we can look forward to more change uh, as we move as we move ahead in the next year or so. But I do think it is something we can look forward to. So let me spend just a few minutes talk a little bit about the past, kind of give a, a review of the year, kind of where we are right now, and then I want to spend the rest of the time talking about the future uh, because I'm incredibly excited about what the future of Augusta University is uh, and, and where we're going. First, let me just start with uh, with a couple of recaps. I mean, as we all know. Uh, Gretchen Coffin, who was provost uh, here for a number of years, and I, I had more than 30 years uh, experience on this particular campus, I finally retired. I kept her around as long as I possibly could. She retired last summer, uh, and we wish her all the best. Uh, and, of course, Zach Kelleher stepped into the fold uh, as the interim provost, and I just want to thank Zach again for the great work he did during that period of time. And fortunately, uh, when the new provost came on board, we didn't lose Zach. He is still with us, and we're delighted about that as the vice provost for instruction. And, of course, we need to welcome our new provost, uh, Neil McKinnon, and, and what a pleasure it has been already for me to work with Neil. Many of you I know have already had a chance to meet him. He's been touring the colleges uh, throughout uh, the campus here at Augusta University. He brings an incredible uh, amount of energy and enthusiasm and fresh ideas about what we are, what we can be. Uh, we're really delighted to, to have Neil Theo. I have told him, though, that uh, his honeymoon is over. I think his honeymoon probably ended before he even started here. Uh, he's not let that slow him down. He's really hit the ground running, and we can expect great things uh, to come out of Neil McKinnon's leadership, and we're so delighted to have him here. We've had a number of other individuals that have joined us or have been promoted during the, the past year, and uh, just this just, just past week, we heard the exciting news. Dr. Kim Davies, who has been the interim dean of Pamphlet, has agreed to be the permanent dean of Pamphlet. We could be more excited, and, and Dr. Davies, we certainly look forward to seeing where your leadership uh, and your experience takes, takes that college and takes our university. Uh, Barry Grassi is our new vice president for audit compliance, ethics, and risk management. He started uh, not too terribly long ago either. And, uh, we want to welcome him to the Gus University family. Uh, Alan Butcher is the new uh, vice president for finance and CFO on the health system, and he brings a wealth of experience uh, in terms of healthcare finance, uh, and which which is already paying dividends for us in many, many ways. And then congratulations to uh, Kristen Engel, who was just recently promoted to Vice President of Communication and Marketing. Kristen's been with us a long, long time. We're just really pleased uh, to have a, uh, the opportunity to have our future be in her hands as well. So uh, welcome to all these folks. I know we've had probably others that I've missed, and uh, I'd always hate to, to take a chance to potentially overlook someone. But if you're new, welcome to Augusta University. Uh, it's an exciting place to be at an exciting time. 
I always want to talk about enrollment because we've got a lot of great things to talk about with regards to enrollment. And this shows you the enrollment trends over the last 10 years, over the last decade. And you can see based on the red uh, uh, dots on this particular graph, the first five years of the last decade, uh, we had year-over-year -year decreases of about 3% uh, in enrollment. We had an about face in 2015. And since 2015, we've shown uh, a year-over-year -year increase of about 2.8% in enrollment. And this is incredibly exciting. 9,565 students is our, is our official total, as my memory serves me correct, for this, this past fall. And we are already seeing record numbers of applications uh, and record numbers uh, of acceptances uh, for the fall coming up. Uh, and it bodes well for what our enrollment as a university will certainly look like. But it's not just the quantity of the students that has increased. The quality of our students has increased as well. Uh, again, the red dots show you that same graph I just presented on, on enrollment, and you can see the blue bars, which is the average freshman index, uh, and since 2016, it has been increasing uh, all along, so not only are we getting more and more students, we're getting more and more high-quality students. They're coming to Augusta University because they know that the high-quality education that they want and deserve can be obtained right here at this university, and they don't have to go very far uh, from where they live or uh, where they live doesn't have the opportunity to present to them what Augusta University has. Uh, and so we can take great pride and uh, a lot of excitement in that. Uh, I wanted to give a good shout out to the, our School of Computer and Cyber Sciences. Just uh, last week, uh, this, this past week, in fact, the Board of Regents approved a PhD in Computer and Cyber Sciences for that, for that very young school. And we are excited about what that's going to represent as, as we expand the offerings that we have uh, in Computer and Cyber Sciences and now really give us the graduate programs that we need there. And it's, that's just the beginning. So my hat's off to Dr. Schwartzman and his, and his faculty for really hitting the ground running with that, that school. We expect great things to come out of cybersecurity uh, and computer science. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. I want to give a, a shout out to, as well to the Medical College of Georgia, uh, Dean Hess uh, and, and Dr. Miller and, and all the folks at MCG. They have put an inordinate amount of work into creating a very novel program called the 3 Plus program. Essentially, what we've done is we've, we've shortened medical school from four years to three years. It automatically eliminates 20, uh, a 25% of the debt that our medical students were, 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 uh, were having to face when they graduated because we've eliminated a year. We're telling students, if you'll do this three-year program and then you do a primary care residency in the state of Georgia and then agree to practice in rural and underserved Georgia, we're going to do our very best to provide you with free tuition. And I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. It's an exciting opportunity, very novel program aimed at incentivizing our young physicians when they graduate to do their residency in the state of Georgia and then to practice uh, in rural and underserved Georgia. We will finally be able to, to attack a huge problem, uh, and that's the number of, of, of locations in the state that just don't have the type of medical care that the citizens of Georgia deserve. So my hat's off to, to MCG, and we're really excited about what this is going to do. Uh, we're also increasing the medical school class. We added another 10 students on the Athens campus. Uh, we, uh, this Just this past uh, fall, we're going to be adding an additional 10 students there. And with, over the next three to five years, we're going to be increasing our medical school class to a total, our uh, M1 class, to a total of 300, 240 on the Augusta campus and 60 on the Athens campus. Uh, that will give us not only an opportunity to incentivize students to go into and practice in rural and underserved Georgia, but increase the number of students from which we have to, to choose uh, to, to be able to do just that. So great opportunity for us uh, as we move ahead. And we have taken, we are receiving notice uh, about this particular program, so much so that the Peach State Health Plan uh, in Georgia uh, has provided a $5.2 million contribution to get this program started uh, and, and to really give us the resources we need to help put these students uh, where they need to be. Hang on to that thought for just a minute because I want to give you some additional exciting news about um, additional money uh, that this contribution has enabled us to, to get a hold of. The legislative session ended uh, the end of March, and uh, it's always an exciting time uh, as, as we work with our General Assembly to provide more support for, for your university, for Augusta University. Uh, they have been incredibly generous with Augusta University and with the entire university system of Georgia this past year. If you know a member of the House or Senate, please thank them for what they did because they have supported higher education tremendously in the state of Georgia. And let me just give you just an idea of the uh, uh, FY 
FY22 appropriations that came out of this General Assembly. I'll be very quick to say that uh, this, these, these figures are all contingent upon the governor signing the budget. We never want to get out too far ahead of the governor. We anticipate that he will do so uh, and over the next month or so. Uh, but it, and when that happens, we will have additional resources to move this university forward. First and foremost, as, you, as many of you may know, we have been working with the General Assembly to increase the formula funding that comes to the Medical College of Georgia. The cost of higher education, the cost of medical education has increased tremendously over the past two decades, but the amount of money that we receive to help fund that has, has been rather stagnant in terms of formula funding. We had, an, uh, we had put in a plan to increase formula funding for a total of $21 million dollars. Over three years, we got the first tranche of that two years ago. COVID-19 hit. We were not able to get the second tranche uh, last legislative cycle. But this year, they have put $7.8 million uh, into the uh, University System of Georgia funding formula that will bring uh, approximately $7 million to the Medical College of Georgia additional recurring. We're very excited about that. I mentioned the gift that we got from, from the Centene and Peach State a moment ago uh, to help the 3-plus program. Legislators also put a $5.2 million matching gift grant into the General Assembly budget this year. For us, that money will be coming to us July 1st, and we're going to match that with the Centene gift, which will give us $10.4 million. We're going to use that in an endowment to cover the scholarships of medical students that want to go into this three-plus program and serve rural and underserved Georgia. Incredibly unique opportunity for us. And finally, well, I think uh, the Medical College of Georgia and your university will be able to start addressing the physician shortage in the state of Georgia. As you know, we had some pretty significant budget cuts uh, this past time due to COVID-19, uh, but the General Assembly was able to, to uh, re restate or restore $1.6 million of the, of the budget cuts that the hospital uh, received uh, in their B budget. So we're very, very grateful for that restoration. Received two hundred forty-one thousand to expand the forensic pathology program, a fellowship program with the uh, Georgia Bureau of Investigation that will allow us to train more coroners for the state of Georgia. A huge shortage there as well. Nine hundred forty-five thousand went to the uh, to the Georgia Cyber Center for a rural, a rural cyber coding project. Essentially, it's going to allow us to develop curriculum that K through twelve teachers can use in their schools throughout the state of Georgia at no cost to them. A great opportunity for us to think about the pipeline of students that are going to be coming in to computer and cyber sciences for the state. And we had a $5 million, uh, what we call a small cap uh, a project, to help us renovate uh, the, uh, the exterior of Christenberry Fieldhouse. Uh, the exterior has been needing some uplift uh, for quite some time. It's going to get a facelift, and we're, we're really excited about that uh, uh, with this $5 million contrib uh, contribution to our budget, which will allow us to do just that. So all in all, a very productive, very successful year. And again, we're incredibly grateful to our uh, General Assembly and our, uh, and our delegation for their support on this. You can't talk about 2020 without talking about, about the coronavirus, COVID-19, it has certainly been uh, the year of the Rona, as my granddaughter calls it, uh, and we have an awful lot to be proud of about having the uh, state's only public academic medical center, the state's only public medical school as part of our university. March 13th, 2020, this photo was taken. It's Dr. Colhay in, uh, in our gym lab showing us the results he had from, from his in-house developed COVID-19 test. Two days later, he was able to use get FDA approval for that test, use that test to diagnose the first positive patient, two of them, in fact, in our health system. And our world was forever changed at that point in time. It's been over a year now, uh, and we have been steadfast working to fight this coronavirus. And I can't tell you how incredibly proud I am of every single one of our health care providers, our frontline care workers across the board for the tremendous work that they have done. In April last year, uh, Governor Kemp uh, called on the university and asked if we would help him in conjunction with the Department of Health to take testing statewide. And we did just that. And in collaborating with the Georgia National Guard, we had 30 guardsmen on our campus for more than three months, 24 hours a day, helping the state schedule patients throughout the entire state to get COVID-19 testing. And, and our health system folks, in, working in conjunction with the National Guard and the Department of Health, set up an additional close to a dozen uh, uh, testing sites throughout the state of Georgia as well to get testing to every citizen we possibly could. Very proud of all the work that we have done uh, with regard to COVID-19 testing. 
And just to show you a little bit of information about this, this shows you the seven-day rolling average for the number of patients that we have tested every day going back for the past year. We have done over 107,000 hotline calls for individuals who are trying to seek COVID-19 testing and arrange for them to get testing. We have sampled more than 159,000 patients through our, our walk-up sites, our, our, our drive-through sites here in Augusta, and working with the National Guard throughout the state. And you can see the number of, of, of sampling that we have done every day had reached a high of almost 800 patients a day uh, sampling for COVID-19 back in, in the uh, back in the last summer. This shows you the positivity rate, which sort of gives us an idea of how prevalent the disease is in our community. And we have done more than 182,000 COVID-19 tests in our lab using the technology that we had to develop the first COVID-19 test in the entire state of Georgia that was not part of the CDC or, or the Department of Health. Really excited about that. We're also excited about the trends uh, we've seen uh, in the past month or so, COVID-19 positivity rates declining, the number of patients, as you'll see, in our hospital has also been declining. We're keeping a very close eye on this. But again, due to the great work that our healthcare providers are doing here, we feel very good about what our future looks like. And this shows you the daily census of the number of COVID-19 positive patients we've had in our hospital going back for the past year. You can see there were, in fact, three phases. Uh, the last phase we had right after Christmas and the month of January, we had as many as 120 patients that were COVID-19 positive in our, in our hospital uh, at one time. A devastating uh, uh, effect to have to deal with that many COVID-19 patients as well as all the other patient care activities that we did. Good news is those numbers have fallen off precipitously uh, and we're been down below 20 uh, patients in the hospital for the past several weeks. And we hope that that trend continues. So how many, patients, how many actual faculty, staff, and students on the, on the campus did we have positive? This shows you the weekly numbers. Uh, the blue bars represent the number of faculty and staff, and the green bars below that, the number of students. That dotted line shows you the, the, the break between the Christmas break that we had. And as you can see, as we came back from Christmas, we had, uh, uh, relatively speaking, a fairly high number of uh, both uh, faculty, staff, and students. But even those numbers, relatively speaking to what you see across the state, were very low, and they fell off precipitously. In the last several weeks, we've had very, very low numbers of cases, thank goodness, and we are certainly optimistic that this trend will continue as well. We'll keep a close eye on after spring break to see how well we are with that. But as you can see, uh, as of the 9th uh, of April, uh, we had, I believe, there were, two, there were two students and four faculty staff that were uh, positive, and those numbers continue to be low. So thank you all for the great work that you do to keep yourself safe, but also keep your family and friends, your colleagues, your coworkers, and your fellow students uh, safe as well. We have been fighting the coronavirus for a long time. It seems like forever. I've heard people say that we now talk about time in COVID years, much like we talk about dog years in terms of, of what that represents to, to, to a dog. It's been an incredible uh, a year this past year uh, as we continue to do this fight. But there is light at the end of the tunnel, and that light is composed primarily of the coronavirus vaccine. You've all heard a tremendous amount about this. And we have taken the expertise that we developed back doing testing and have applied it to doing mass vaccination. Now, we have vaccinated well over 55,000 individuals in just our health system alone uh, and, and in the community provided by our health care providers uh, to date. Uh, and this experience, along with uh, the ability to get the vaccine has allowed us to take testings in, uh, uh, take vaccinations into the community uh, in very, very uh, unique ways. Governor Kemp, uh, several weeks back, announced that he was opening up several mass vaccination sites throughout the state. And when he was asked about Augusta, he said, I'm not putting one in Augusta. And I'm not putting one in Augusta because I don't have to. Augusta already has it under control. And he was talking about AU Health System. So again, I, I, I can't thank our healthcare providers uh, and our staff members uh, here for, for doing incredible work to allow us to take the leadership role that we should take as the state's only public academic medical center and state's only public medical school. Very proud of that, of that activity. And we couldn't have done it without a huge number of individuals. We've had all sorts of volunteers who've stepped forward to help us in the, doing throughout this vaccination process. Students, especially what great experience it is for for our healthcare students 
uh, to be able to, to, to vaccinate their fellow students, uh, faculty, staff, uh, and citizens throughout the community. It's been 396 days, 396 days since the first positive test uh, in our health system, and we're still counting. Uh, and our health care providers get up every single day and, and come to work and fight this virus, uh, and we're so very fortunate that we have them here. I had the real distinct pleasure earlier this year of presenting the 2020 Augusta University President's Award, the highest award given by the university to our health care heroes, our AU heroes. Uh, standing with me there is Katrina Kiefer, the CEO of the health system. She accepted the, the award on behalf of the thousands of men, uh, men and women who had day-to-day -day fight this coronavirus. And we're so very, very grateful for the work that you have done and continue to do every single day. Well, that sort of gives you just an overview, a, sort of a recap of what the year uh, has been like. It's, it's been, as, as we pointed out from the very beginning, like no other. But what about tomorrow? And this is something that I am incredibly excited about, what the future of this university looks like. What about tomorrow? What can we take from the experience we've had this past year uh, and apply it to what the future is going to look like? And a lot of people ask me, said, you know, President Kiel, what's your vision? We want to know what your vision is. Well, I'm going to speak to that. But the most important thing to me is that this has to be our vision. We have to come together and determine what our university is and our healthcare system is going to look like as we move forward. And we are in the most unusual uh, and in unique position, I think, of any university in the country. Because, folks, we're still only eight years old, if you think about the consolidated university. And we still have a blank slate about what Augusta University is going to be for decades and decades to come. What a very unique opportunity for us all to be able to, to fill in that blank slate starting today. Uh, and I want to talk to you a little, bit about, a little bit about what that might look like. So while I'm not going to tell you necessarily what my personal vision is, because it has to be our vision, I do want to tell you what I think about uh, and what keeps me awake at night and what I get excited about. And so to give you some of the things that I think we should be doing uh, as a university as we move forward. First and foremost, let me tell you, I have tremendous hope for the future. As we come out of COVID, and yes, we will eventually come out of COVID, that's going to be a pent-up excitement and enthusiasm about just getting back to normal, getting back together. And I think we can harness that excitement as a university and really chart a course for where we're going to be going over the next three to five years. We're always going to be using as our guiding principles the fact that you've heard me say many times we have one priority at this university and one priority only, and that's our students and our patients. And if we continue to hold that as the bedrock uh, of what our mission should be, then I think we're all going to be able to accomplish all the great things that we all know we can do. First off, the, the Beyond Boundaries, the, the strategic plan we've had in place has served us very well, very well. It's nearing its end. It's time for a new strategic plan. And what an exciting point in our history, what an exciting point in time to be able to think about what this might look like. Please stay tuned for this. You're going to be hearing more about this in the coming weeks to months as together, together in a very inclusive way, we come together to try to determine what our next five years should look like with regards to the strategic plan. But there are a couple things that I think are going to be paramount as we begin this planning process. And I'm going to start with research. We are one of the four research universities in the state. And we all know we are not where we need to be with regard to research. We know that. Now, one of the ways that we can, we can think about how we rank, how we compare with other healthcare, uh, academic health centers and academic uh, health care uh, providers uh, and universities that, that have a, as health is a major part of what they do are, is rankings. Uh, and one of the main rankings that we look at with a medical school is the NIH funding ranking. And this shows you how we have ranked uh, compared to the other 140-something uh, medical schools and academic health centers throughout the state uh, going back to 2001. We've been declining in our ranking number, and that's a good thing. From rankings, you want the lower number possible. And as you can see, we started out back in, in, the, in the early 2001 or so, back up in the 80s, and now we're ranked around, around 70, 71, 72, 73 has been sort of where we are. We own this sort of downward trajectory. That's a good thing. But I think all of us would agree the slope is not steep enough. We need to be increasing in our ranking at a much more aggressive rate. Our rankings depend upon how much NIH money that our, our investigators 
win through their uh, NIH uh, grant uh, activity. And this shows you what our grant dollars, uh, NIH grant dollars, have looked like over that same, roughly that same time period. And it, it has, in fact, been increasing. But we're not making the type of progress that I think we all believe we should be making. I certainly know that, and I'm committed to changing this trajectory. If we think about where we might, well, where we should be, we should at least be in the top 60 among our 140 medical schools. And if we look at what the top 60, that, that 60th ranking looks like in terms of funding each year going back to 2006, that's the red line at the top. The gap between the blue line, which is MCG, and the red line, which is the top 60 uh, medical school at the time, is about $14 million. So in other words, we have about a $14 million gap to, 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 to fill, to, to, to get to, in order for us to be in the top 60. And we've got to try to find a way to do this. You've heard me talk an awful lot about the concept of 16 by 30. And, and that, that's uh, something with, that I mentioned about two or three years ago, and, and it's really taken root. It's got people that are energized and excited about how do we plan to have 16,000 students at this university by the year 2030. And we're making great progress towards that. It's become a rallying cry, if you will, for all of our, 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 our schools to try to help bring more students to this university and all that that means, 16 by 30. Well, I think it's time we did something similar to research. And so what I'm proposing we do is rally around another uh, opportunity for master planning and for research, 60 by 30. We want 16,000 students at this university by the year 2030. We want to be ranked in the top 60 medical schools uh, in this country by the year 2030 as well. Uh, and we're going to be doing everything we can to try to help us get to that point. How do we do it? Well, it's going to take investment, pure and simple. It's just going to take investment. It's going to take investment in people, primarily faculty, researchers, uh, and, and the support uh, folks that they need, and infrastructure. Uh, and I, I have been having conversations with our new provost about this very topic. And I asked Dr. McKinnon to start talking to his deans uh, and his faculty about what, what, do we knew, what do we need to really get us into that top 60? How do we jumpstart research at this university in a major, major way? And what, how can we make investments in people and infrastructure and do it very strategically that's going to move the needle for us? And what they have come up with is perhaps the most innovative and, and exciting program in research in the history of this university. And it's called TRIBA. It's a cluster hiring initiative uh, that is termed Transdisciplinary Research Initiative in Inflammaging and Brain Aging. If you haven't heard the term inflammaging before, go look it up. Google it. It's an exciting way of looking at how we as the human body uh, ages and all the processes that take place with that. And it also especially brings in brain aging and the implications that that has uh, as, we, as we age. And this, this concept came up from the faculty they say, if we could focus on this sort of cluster hiring, if we could focus on this area of research, it would instantly move us ahead uh, in many ways and really serve to bring research into this, into this university. What is a cluster hire? Well, it's just that you go and hire faculty in a particular area. And over the next three years, I pledge to, to, to invest $15 million to recruit between 15 and 20 new faculty uh, in this area of, of inflammation and brain aging. Probably also going to need to invest another five to 10 million in research renovations in space. And I'll get to space a little bit more in just a minute. And this is a collaboration that came from the faculty. It's a multidisciplinary collaboration across six schools and colleges. Obviously, the Medical College of Georgia was a key part of this, but it also included faculty from the Dental College, the College of Science and Mathematics, which you should know is moving to the Health Sciences campus. College of Nursing, College of Allied Health Sciences, and the School of Computer and Cyber Sciences, a truly disciplinary approach to an extremely important area of research for us. And this 15 and 20 faculty will, will be spread among those colleges. The, the, the primarily, we'll, we'll fund uh, researchers coming into the Medical College of Georgia, but we're also going to be funding faculty in these other colleges as well, all aimed at a collaborative approach to try to address this area which is to focus on research to improve the outcomes for those suffering from Alzheimer's disease, dementia, and other brain aging diseases. 
This is a once in a lifetime opportunity for us as a university to not only do the types of things we should be doing and addressing a hugely important health issue for us as a community, but to finally get a foothold in research like we need to do and give us that jump start we need to move forward. This is just the beginning, and we know that, but what an exciting beginning it is. Where are these scientists going to go? Well, I'm going to talk about that. Now, we have two opportunities. The first is standing right in front of us here. We're going to be opening the, the College of Science and Mathematics building. Uh, I'm told uh, next month we'll start moving faculty and staff in, and our undergraduate students will start uh, having their activities there in the fall. The fourth floor uh, of that building was always planned to be shell space, and as we, as we gained uh, the resources, we, we planned to expand that and build it out in terms of research. We just got approval from the Board of Regents, and I've invested the resources into this, as well as the savings that our fantastic facilities folks did in terms of keeping us under budget and on time. We're going to be finishing off that four-floor space. It's more than 20,000 square feet of research space. And this is where uh, the initial faculty from that interdisciplinary cluster hire will go. It will provide fantastic space. It will provide space where they can collaborate, interact with each other, which is what this is really all about. And interestingly, it puts it on top of an undergraduate building. Can you imagine the excitement that's going to provide and the opportunities it's going to provide for us uh, as a health sciences dedicated university to interest young people in going into a variety of areas associated with this, especially in research? Now, we know we need more than just one building. And there are three or four priorities on campus that we're beginning to look at even as we speak. And this shows you, this is a, a, a map of the Health Sciences campus, a part of the Health Sciences campus. If you look in on the right toward the bottom, you see the Dental College of Georgia and the Medical College of Georgia kind of uh, orients you there. And that little box I have drawn is the College of Science and Mathematics building, which opens up, as, I, as I've indicated, this year. We know we need three things on this campus right away, and we're working hard to make those things happen. We need a new parking deck. That's number one there. Uh, and I think we're very close to being able to start seriously planning for that parking deck. We know parking is the problem here. We need number two. That's a new dormitory, and we're, we're, we're beginning to have conversations with our system office now about what that might look like and how we might, how we might actually address that. We are at over 100% occupancy in, in Open Elm Hall now as it is, so we know we need more uh, living space for students. And number three is a, is a new dining complex and student engagement center, which will allow us to put a, a storefront right on the, on the corner of 15th Street and Laney Walker, aimed at providing activities and things that our students desperately need in terms of engagement, everything from eating to, to fitness to wellness uh, to classroom space, et cetera, right on that space. We know we need those and we're working on it. But we've also begun to have serious conversations now about what number four might look like there, a new translational and basic science research building located, this has been master planned since 2015, located right across the street, right across Laney Walker from the Sanders building and the interdisciplinary research building, right in the heart of the research corridor for Augusta University. And we are beginning to plan for that too. We're not going to be able to move research, the research needle like we need to without research space. Uh, and this, I think, will give us the space that we need. So stay tuned for that. A lot of excitement associated with that. We talked about research. The other thing that I think we have to focus on as we plan what our future is going to look like is enrollment. You've already heard me talk a little bit about it. It is so critical for us as a university that we continue to focus on increasing enrollment. If we're going to get to 16,000 students by the year 2030, I think there's a number of things that we need to do. One is that we've got to make Augusta University a destination campus. And when I talk about a destination campus, excuse me, I don't mean just a des destination for Georgia, as important as that is. We need Augusta University to be a destination campus for the entire country, if not the entire world. Uh, and we need to think bigger about how do we do that. Well, one of the things we have to, we have to think about is that we have got to make ourselves stand out from the pack. There are 26 campuses in the University System of Georgia, and all of them are great. They offer great programs. What do we do that's different? How do we stand out? How, how do we stand out to a high school sophomore or junior that's beginning to think about colleges where he or she wants to go and get their education? What do we do to stand out? Well, I've said all along, we need to have some marquee programs. 
but we're going to have the basic uh, the programs that you would expect to see from a comprehensive university. But I think we have to have a couple that instantly energize students and make them interested in seeing uh, what Augusta University is all about. And those two marquee programs are cybersecurity uh, and the health sciences. And I'm using health sciences in the broadest terms possible. Cybersecurity and health sciences, we know are two opportunities for Augusta University to stand out well above all of our other campuses across the state, and that's going to help us tremendously in terms of enrollment. The Georgia Cyber Center has now uh, been fully functional and operational for well over a year, almost two years now. It's 320,000 square feet of the most unique space in the entire country. Governor Deal invested $100 million in this facility, the single largest investment in cybersecurity of any state in the nation, even today. And we are right at a point now to where we need to begin to start thinking about how we expand the Georgia Cyber Center. And we're already beginning to give thought to what that might look like. Our, our dean of the School of Computer and Cyber Sciences is already bursting at the seams uh, in terms of space. Uh, and that's a darn good problem to have. So we're excited about where that's going to go. The Army is moving the Cyber Command to Augusta, uh, Georgia. We know that out of Fort Gordon. Uh, the three-star flag has already been transferred here, and we're going to begin to see a huge increase in activity associated with that out of Fort Gordon. That's going to bring business and industry from all over the world here. And the Georgia, Cy Georgia Cyber Center provides us with the opportunity to do just that. We have got to take advantage of the fact that we are the Georgia Cyber Center and that we have the most unique opportunity to provide cybersecurity and computer training of anywhere else in the country because of the investment the state of Georgia has made in us. That is the ecosystem in that environment of business, academia, and government. Uh, and that, that tripartite ecosystem is something that makes us so unique. And I think we as a university have to take better advantage of the programs that we have there. And how do we merge what may not seem to be of any relationship to cybersecurity, computer science? How do we merge those two together? How do we bridge arts and cyber and do it in a very unique way? How do we develop opportunities, educational opportunities for students to take advantage of the unique thing that we have in the Georgia Cyber Center and make us even more unique in terms of recruiting students? How do we take advantage of that? I'm looking forward to seeing what our uh, incredible faculty can come up with, and they've already come up with a number of programs that, that'll begin to address that right away. So that's one marquee program. The other marquee program I mentioned are, are health sciences, and again, very broadly. We are, quote, the state's dedicated health sciences medical college in the University System of Georgia, the only one that has that designation. We're the only school in the entire University System of Georgia Public has a, uh, has a medical school, public, the only dental school, and we are also the only academic, medical, um, academic medical center public in the state of Georgia. And we need to really start taking advantage of that more so than we're already doing in very, very, very creative ways. So how do we take advantage of that that already allows us to stand out in terms of developing programs? And how do we bridge arts and health, again, using health in the broadest terms possible? How do we create programs that's going to make us stand out from the pack? And that's going to allow us to recruit students from all over Georgia and all over the country, and in fact, all over the world. Now, one thing to think about, it, we're already beginning to get a lot of students to come to Gus University because they, they know that getting their undergraduate education here makes them more competitive in terms of going on to a graduate or professional career uh, in the broad field of health sciences. But it is comp incredibly competitive. For medicine, dentistry, and uh, uh, nursing, and a variety of our programs uh, in allied health, there are as many as 10 to 13 applications for every seat. Not every person is going to get into medical school. Not every person who thinks they might want to be a physician or a dentist or a nurse, once they get into college, realize that, no, that's not exactly what I want to do. I don't really want to have the patient care, but I still have an interest in the area. And then they flounder because what they thought was their original dream is not going to come to fruition. We've got to find catchment opportunities for these students so we don't lose these students to another university or we don't lose them to just simply dropping out. And we've got to come up with very creative programs that allow these students to have the propensity, the interest in the health fields or in the cybersecurity and, uh, and computer fields to be able to get a degree here at this institution. We need to provide more than we're already doing alternative programming for these students so we keep these students here. 
Two ways to increase enrollment. One is to increase the number of students that walk in the door, and the other is to keep the students that are already here. And retention is going to be equally as important uh, as recruitment in terms of enrollment. So what I'm asking the faculty now, what I'm asking you, is what are the other marquee programs we need to have here at Augusta University? You need to help us write that story. What are going to be those marquee programs, in addition to the two I've already mentioned, that allow us to stand out so we can be more competitive in terms uh, of increasing not only the quantity of students, but continue to increase the quality of our students as well. And then the last thing I want to mention about this is online education. If COVID-19 has taught us anything, is that you really can teach anything online. And we are creative and innovative enough to be able to do just that. And I think we need to take an opportunity to really, to really think about this in very unique and very creative ways. And we've got to do it quickly, folks, because I promise you a lot of other universities are beginning to think about the same thing. So we, we can't let the old ways of lecturing hinder us in terms of finding new and creative ways moving forward. Now, I'm not proposing that we take the, the traditional classroom experience of a university and convert the whole university to an online university. That's not what I'm talking about. But what if we were to take the class, the course catalog that you see here as just an example and, and say, by the year 2025, Augusta University will have every undergraduate course offered, which can be taken either in person or online every semester. What would that look like? Could we convert this uh, course catalog into the course catalog that you see on the right, where a student can choose between an in-person or an online version of a particular course? This is not just aimed at trying to expand our reach, but, which it most certainly will do to attract students who would not ordinarily have the opportunity or the desire to, to physically come to Gus University, but it will help our traditional classroom students who, who, who inevitably have things happen in their lives that forces them to, to drop out of the classroom experience because of work or family matters or whatever. If they can take an online course instead, we can keep them enrolled, and then the next semester they can come right back into the classroom. It provides unlimited flexibility for our students, unlimited opportunities for us. We're already in the process. We, we brought a consultant in to help, help us take a look at how we increase the online footprint we have here. It is an unbelievable opportunity for us, and I'm excited to, to see where this goes. You've heard the term uh, disruption, disruptive technology, disruptive innovation. We have to be disruptive. Now, I'm not suggesting everybody go out and get a hammer and start taking it to things, but I think we have to break the old molds of how we do things. Business as usual is no longer acceptable, and that's the way we've always done it is a phrase we have to eliminate. We have to start now saying, what are the ways in which we can do it? How, how do we set ourselves apart? What are the exciting things we can do that are going to bring students from all over the world here to this destination, Augusta University? And lastly, I want, I want to end on perhaps the most important aspect of this entire presentation. We want to attract people here. We want to keep people here. We want to have the type of environment that makes all people comfortable here. Diversity, equity, inclusion has got to be a hallmark in every single thing we do, and that is certainly going to be true moving forward, and I'm totally committed to, to doing just that. I have just recently uh, stood up a task force on celebrating the diverse story of Augusta University, ably chaired by Cedric Johnson. Many of you know Cedric. It contains a number of faculty, current faculty, staff, our student representation, uh, and folks from the community that will help us come together and adequately and, and even more so tell the story of Augusta University, tell the, 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 the rich diversity that we have at Augusta University and the contributions made by peoples from all walks of life to who we are now and who we have been in the past. And, I, and I'm excited about what this committee is going to come forward with recommendations to how we do just that. So we've got a lot to think about. We have a lot to ponder uh, but we also have a lot of hard work to do. And I'm convinced that we can continue to do the things that we have done this past year. And we have all come together in the most amazing and unique and innovative ways that I think any of us have ever seen. If we can continue that, that momentum, couple it with the excitement of getting back to some sort of normal life, uh, 
marry that to this concept of we're going to be planning the next five years for this university. Just imagine what we can do. It is a new day for us as a university. Uh, I'm very, very excited about this. The state of this university is incredibly strong, probably stronger than it ever has been, and we have the most, the most incredible bright future that I think anybody can imagine. The future is, of course, what we make it. And together we can make the future that we feel we deserve uh, and the future that we can be proud of. And I certainly look forward to working with you towards that end. So thank you so much for taking a little bit of your time out on such a beautiful Friday afternoon to to spend uh, with me here today. I hope that, that you can come away from this with the same feeling of hope and enthusiasm that I have about what Augusta University is going to be in the next five years. Uh, And I look very much forward to working with you towards that end. So thank you very much. Please have a a safe uh, and, and healthy weekend.